doing the work that you do, considering how personal this is to you, the, the nature of the conversations you constantly have, the kind of stories you must hear all the time. How are you taking care of yourself? How are you doing? It's a great question. And I am actually super excited that you led with that because um, I think so much of a, a of so many of us in the helping profession, uh, especially in mental health, just see so much work that needs to be done, so many things that need to be changed. And we always put our well-being in the backseat until we're completely burnt out. So I've been down that path. I don't want to be down that path again. I went through a pretty major episode of depression in my spring of 2012 that, you know, pretty much wrecked me for a long time. So I don't want to go back there. So ever since then, I do a number of things to prioritize my well-being. One is I have a daily ritual. I think many, um, many people discovered this during COVID. I discovered it after my depression episode that starting your day with a morning ritual that is mind, body, and spirit, even in short form, um, can really do such great things to set your day up for success. So I'm a, I'm a wannabe runner. I, I was not given any of the jock jeans, but uh, so running is pre pretty much what I can do because you can't really screw that up. I'm super slow, but I get the job done. So I do some kind of running or hiking or walking thing with my dog. Uh, I gr you know write gratitude journals and I have a daily practice of writing gratitude and then what to expect and what I'm looking forward to and daily affirmations. I meditate. And so all of those things are part of, I, I go to support group most mornings. All of those things are part of like the first two hours of my day. It's like not a small thing. It's a big thing. For first two hours of my day, I get up really early um, and just start the day that, that way. So those are my daily practices. The other piece that's really important for my self-care and soul care, as my friend Sarah Gear likes to call it, how I fuel my soul is that I travel a lot for work, but in my travel, like I'm doing right now, I tag on something. I tag on time with friends. I tag on an adventure travel kind of thing. I, I, I do things outside of work that make it meaningful or social or restful or something. Um, and then the third thing I say is that I prioritize sleep. So this is also very hard when you're traveling a lot because of time zones and that kind of stuff. Um, but I have all, and I don't sleep well anyway. So I know how important sleep is to all things related to health and longevity. Uh, so I have a lot of tricks, a lot of practices, a lot of rituals, including a mask that's actually right here, you know, a mask that plays Bluetooth into my ears, like all the things. I've gotten all the things down because um, when I start to lose sleep is when I, my, I start to lose my mental health. So I really try to prioritize that to the best of my ability and a bunch of other things. But I think that's probably good enough for now. That is super <laughs> helpful. To, uh, and yes, it's the same with me when the moment I'm not like get that notification from my watch, you're not getting enough sleep. And I noticed right away, yeah, something's not right with my mental health either. This month, got barely any sleep. I have, I'm having tremors again. That's like the first sign that my mental health is getting worse. So, so, so true. And gratitude, of course, because it, it gets said a lot. Like everyone talks about gratitude. I think that is one of the reasons why it has lost to some people. Some people think it's been commercialized it's been hijacked gratitude everyone's talking about gratitude but there's a reason for it because it's awesome and it lights you up right away awesome. yeah. yeah well and i also learned this from one of my podcast guests that you know our brains are wired to solve problems so if you give it the problem to solve of go think of something that you're grateful for right now and then go think of something you're really excited that's going to happen in you know the near future that's what your brain thinks about first thing in the morning. You give it a task, it's on the task. And that's what I want my brain to be thinking about. Not like, oh my God, my to-do list, or like this thing's not going well, or that person's mad at me. Like, no, like, what are we grateful for? What are we looking forward to? And that's what I think about first thing in the morning. It's great. I love it. To totally works. Totally works. Yeah, and a wonderful way to start your day. Let me ask yeah. you, um, what do you think is the biggest threat to mental health in the world that we're living in right now? That is a really big question. <laughs> <laughs> the biggest threat to mental health in the world that we're living in right now. Oof, I have like five or six answers popping up in my head. I, uncertainty and complexity, I guess, are the big terms that I'm coming up with. But um, That makes sense. You know, so for example, 
big questions are lingering, especially with our young adults, about their futures. Climate change, global unrest, economic uncertainty. I mean, I have three young adult sons, and they cannot, you know, find a way to make a living that supports their living, (laughs) you know, like, and this is just one of several things that is really weighing on them. And, you know, they're rising to the task, but it's very much these kinds of things that are hovering. AI, I think is another one. I mean, AI is super cool right now, but we can all see like our world's going to be completely different in like six months, two years. We're not even going to recognize where this has taken us. Um, And all of our science fiction (laughs) Nightmares and dreams will start coming true. true. I mean, it's it's true. And and will we have jobs because it, these things are happening, or will we be able to function with the skill set that we've been trained in? We don't even know. Uh, and I think that causes a lot of uncertainty. So that's a big one: the complexity and uncertainty of our futures. I think another one for the United States will continue to be our relationship with drugs and alcohol and specifically the opioid crisis that has not been cleared up at all and we now know is seeping into you know just about everybody's family in some way so that's a big threat i feel like that is that i just need to call out because addiction is often easily hideable um but it does impact a lot of families yeah so the reason that I ask this question is because simply because I, whenever we talk about mental health, we always go to the the usual culprits. We think about the things that cause us anxiety, like the overwork, being overworked, uh, the relationships in our lives. We're not really focused on all the things that have changed that have shifted. Because I remember 10 years back when I went into, when my mental health got really, really bad and I went into therapy, we talked about what is a threat to your mental health. So therefore what you have to focus on That conversation was so different from what is threatening to mental health now. But we Mm -hmm. don't consciously consider that in the sense that we still go to those those same culprits. We forget that I am more preoccupied about the economy because it's not so immediate. It doesn't feel so immediate. It feels like this is Mm -hmm. somebody else's problem, not quite my problem. My problem is my own family's financial situation. That's one of the reasons why I asked this question, because I want people to consider that so that as they're planning, you know, self-care, planning to bring up certain topics with their families, they think about these things. Like very few of us discuss how war happening between two countries, two countries that are not your own is um, impacting you. Oh, yeah. No, I have dear friends who have polarized views on this that can't speak to each other. And I have a lot of a lot of people in my life that fear for their safety and their loved ones. I have, you know, people on college campuses now who are canceling graduation ceremonies. I mean, it's a big deal. Like, it's a big deal because people are very heated and and, and it's just causing a lot of unrest everywhere. Yes, yeah. that's so true. And that's something else that we don't even consider. How are we even supposed to seek out support when um, the people that we would go to for support may not see things how we see it and if that mm-hmm. becomes a problem? So, so tell me what solutions you would ask people to consider as they, you know, battle with these situations? Ooh, big questions. Big, quick, big questions. I don't know anybody has the answer to. Yeah, the reason <laughs> I'm asking you these questions is because I know the conversations you have all the time and you mm-hmm. are someone who has, I think, more deeply considered all of this and you are actively trying to help people. Yeah. I, and I do like to think on this level, like systems and cultural change kinds of approaches to well-being versus what medication or what therapy, which again, has its role in in the whole thing of things. But I think in our country, we overemphasize the medicalized aspects of mental health and we underappreciate the environmental, social, structural, all of those things. So I appreciate the question. I just can't tell you that I've totally thought it through. Um, No, but I think, no, I have. I have. I just got to figure out how to connect the dots in my head. So one of the things that I think eats at our well-being in our country, especially, is divisiveness. We tend to get really polarized and then it's all us and them, all us and them. And then the more we plant down on our side, the more they look evil and and then everything gets interpreted through a lens of their evil. I think that's very, very problematic for our country's well-being. As you probably know, uh, we're dying younger and younger 
a lot of our um, evaluations of our well-being show that we are more and more stressed. We have more and more stress-related illnesses. Like we are a really unwell country, and I feel that it has a lot to do with this divisiveness. So what I would recommend on that front is quit it. <laughs> I don't know if you remember that uh, the, the the therapist show, but his his answer to everything was just just quit it. But really, like quit it, yeah. um, and 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 sit down with people that are different than you, who have different viewpoints, and hold the judgment back, and understand why they are the way they are, and why they have the worldviews that they have, and what was their life story that got them to this point. And I promise you, you do that with an open heart you're going to see a human being that looks a lot more like you than is different than you. And I know for people who are so entrenched in their hate and so entrenched in their belief structure, that is a very big ask. But I, I'm, I believe that's how we get through this. And then, and that's going to, you know, help our own mental health and help our, our country's mental health. Um, so rather than just hunker up with the peers that see the world the way you do, which just kind of emboldens our, our world views, like step, step over, be curious. How do people get there? How did they get to the place that they're at holding a very different view than you? It's a challenging emotional experience, but it's a rewarding one when you get there. So for example, I was born in Connecticut. I have a uh, pretty liberal views. I'm not, I wouldn't say I'm uber progressive, but I have pretty liberal views. Never saw a gun, thought about guns, like not even on my radar ever until probably until Columbine. So that's gen, you know, decades into my life when I was living in Colorado and all of a sudden we had a mass shooting pretty much in my backyard. And now today I talk about gun safety with communities who are firearm owners. Okay. This girl has zero credibility. Um, but I feel like, I feel like it's very important for me to understand their perspective on their Second Amendment rights and their history with firearms and how much it means to them. And then together in a very respectful conversation, we can find a place where I can say, your family's not as safe when there's suicide on the menu, when you have a firearm in your house and they can hear that, right? And I can hear, you're not going to get my damn guns out of my house. Like, okay, I got you. Like, find, let's find a way to make your house safer for your people in your house that experience suicidal thoughts. So that's one example. And, you know, I also work in a pretty conservative industry most days. I work in the construction space most days and they're, they're very conservative fiscally, uh, in their political views, uh, in, in all the things. And we deeply respect each other. So I never knew that I would be accepted by any of those groups, but I think it's really important for me to get out of my own shell of what I've experienced in my life and what I think is true and really try to understand things from their perspective if I'm really going to be able to be of value. Yeah. I live in India. I talk to people on my podcast who are mostly, mostly we have American guests. Like I have 90% of my guests are Americans. And now this one pressure that I feel whenever I, I put together my questions, it used to be about letting curiosity lead and just loving the guests that I, I've been really lucky with my guests. I love all of my guests. And so I can just, you know, bring my curiosity and that's all, you know, it's good. But now I have to really be very careful about how I frame my questions, what questions I ask, because I know there is a political aspect to everything. And then suddenly you're being categorized, even though I don't live in America, I live here in India, we don't have the same, we're not facing the same political issues that America is facing. We're not discussing the same things that Americans are discussing. But I have to be so careful because I, if I ask the wrong question or I frame it the wrong way, the guest ends up thinking, oh, you are, you believe this. Is that what you're asking me? And I think you're wrong. And suddenly I'm like, what is happening now? And <laughs> so that happened to me a couple of times on the interview. And I was like, this is so, this is strange. And my friends told me like, that was, I think my hundredth interview. And my friends are like, if it took you hundred interviews to have an incident like that, you're good, you're fine. <laughs> 
<laughs> but I, <laughs> it is shocking because you're trying to just be open-minded and curious exactly. and then what exactly. you say gets interpreted through their own filters of yeah. whatever it is they're they're coming at yeah yeah mm -hmm. that's another stress unnecessary or i don't know whether that's unnecessary or not but a stress that's placed on your on you and that's something you have to be mindful of because it's such an explosive situation or it can become a very explosive situation and yeah so you are you're so right and we are now having to talk about things that I think a lot of us don't understand. That's something that, that I think somebody brought up on a podcast where they said that no, you don't have to have an opinion about everything. Be informed, but don't vocalize that opinion. It is not necessary for a you know school teacher to opine about a country's, you know, a war going on in some country. It's okay if you don't have an opinion. It's all good. So I think, yeah, that is something we have to check out of certain conversations or yeah. I think one of the tools that used to be fairly effective was therapy. Like therapy used to be a very safe space. Do you believe that considering the conversation that we are now having about therapy, victim behavior and overdiagnosis that is happening, do you think therapy continues to be a safe space, a tool that should be uh, considered if your if your mental health is not as it, you know, as it should? Gosh, you're good. Very good. A big questions. So therapy right. means a lot of different things to different people. It runs a gamut between what, again, what I would say would be more like a medicalized treatment modality, everything from ECT, you know, kind of a medicalized medicine-based uh, experience to, you know, somebody could say like a spiritual retreat is part of therapy, right? And then like all kinds of other ways that people do it. So what I'm a big fan of is what works for people. And again, I'm not being flippant, but different people need different things and different people resonate with different things and different people think different things are credible, which also impacts how effective they are, right? If you don't, if you think something's full of malarkey, you're not even going to give it a chance. And you could take a pill from a doctor who says this is going to help you, and it's a sugar pill, but you don't know that. But if it's a doctor giving it to you, you're going to have a placebo effect. It's going to help you. You know, so it's very interesting. What does what does therapy mean, and is it going to be helpful? I I'm an advocate for let's innovate, because I think what has happened, partly due to our over reliance on diagnosis in this space and our over-reliance largely again United States based but our over-reliance from our insurance system they need the code so they know what to bill I get it it's shorthanding communication but it's very difficult to put people in boxes we are way too complex in this part of our lives and fluid and I think the simplification to a diagnosis has really not helped us uh overall um so i would like us to innovate more because what i see happening is that there are a few therapies that are easier to measure so things like cognitive behavioral kinds of things where we're looking at behavior change or you know things that are a little bit more easier to measure in the short run tend to get a lot of attention and I was trained as a behavior therapist, so I was attracted to that too. Um, and then you get in there, there and you're like, is that really recovery? Is that really somebody having a transformational experience? Or is it just the superficial behavior because it's easier to measure? And again, some types of behavioral therapy, some types of cognitive therapy, super helpful for people. I'm not knocking it, but it gets a lot of attention in the research because it's easier to measure. Um, and I as I've evolved, have gotten more jaded because I've watched our systems fail. I've watched our traditional therapies that have been approved work in the short run, but not the long run. And I've watched other people have more transformational experiences that have been longer lasting through experiences with their faith and spiritual awakenings or with animal assisted therapy you know, which got totally knocked down by, you know, scientists uh, for a long time. 
we've been connected to animals our entire evolution. Yes. Why would you think that that not, might not be a viable form of healing for people? It's reciprocal. I mean, anyone who has a pet can tell you their pet is a big part of their mental health. I know it's true for me. So why would we just poo-poo that? Well, it's, you know, a threat to one's identity when you can say a dog will do a better job than somebody I'm paying $200 an hour. <laughs> Maybe it's true on some days. I don't know. Um, I'm also a big fan of 12-step of types of healing for people. Um, there's a lot of beauty in that. Uh, again, it's not for everybody, but let's put it on the buffet and make it a legitimate place that people can go. It's universal acceptance to a group of peers have already walked the path. There's a stepwise progression. You can choose it as you like it. And it also has a spiritual component. Like for me, that's a good good number of good things in the salad. <laughs> um, and it's free, you know, and millions and millions of people around the world have been helped and are helped every day. So I would just like the mental health world to like get over itself, basically. <laughs> um, listen to what the people say is actually helping them through things. Stop focusing so much on the things that give us marginal changes. And for, for this example, in my world, I focus a lot on suicide prevention. And again, the United States in particular, we are absolutely obsessed with predictive risk assessments. That's all people talk about. That's all the all the research. That's all people talk about is what tools are you using? You know, how's your, you know, risk assessment work? And I'm like, yeah, we have decades of research that show we can't do it. We cannot predict imminent risk with our with our tools, you know, marginal, tiny little increments of success. And I don't think any of that is helping anybody. Nobody is being helped by being asked a million questions in an interrogated form as you check boxes on your checklist. Like nobody's being helped by that. You're just trying to get over your fear of somebody dying on your watch. I understand that that's scary. But let's really get back to the business of helping people. I, I don't know. I'm I'm very jaded right now <laughs> with uh, as continuing to do the same things over and over again and not getting any. Uh, and like, why are things not changing? You know. Yeah, understandable. Yeah. We all latch on to a certain way of doing things because I think after a point, it just starts to make you feel safer because it's of its familiarity, I guess. But in doing so, I think you are absolutely right. We do miss out on the main point which is to help people and when you're dealing with human beings each one is so completely unique that yeah we have to really consider that so it's safe to like what you're recommending here is that somebody having mental health issues should maintain an exploratory mindset um and uh, like no, therapy is not necessarily for everyone but perhaps we should try and access the more available the more easily accessible solutions like getting a pet or spirituality religion both and i'm gonna say both and I, I would say yeah exploratory mindset is a good way to put it put a lot of things on the buffet give them a taste see if it works for you and i the other thing i advocate for i mean there's a lot of really great therapists out there i don't want to knock therapy off the table completely there's also a lot that are burnt out um so shop uh, a lot of people, a lot of everyday consumers of therapy don't recognize that they are the consumers of this service and they get to say, this isn't working for me. I need to try something else. And after you know one or two sessions, if it's not working, you can walk away and it's okay. In fact, any therapist worth their salt should be preempting that by saying, let's see if this feels like a good fit. And if it's not no harm, no foul, We'll find you with somebody else. They should be saying that. But a lot of people feel like they're locked in. They have a couple of, you know, therapy sessions. They're like, this is for the birds. And then they never go back. Rather than thinking of it as a mismatch in a relationship, they think the whole thing is, you know, not going to be any good. So to really empower people to think, you know, you're the one driving the bus here. If it doesn't work for you, let's keep searching. So searching within different forms of modalities of treatment, different types of providers, different ways of getting therapy, whether it's telehealth or whatever, like you get to explore that. And uh, the other thing I'll acknowledge is that that's hard to do when you're feeling depleted and lost and overwhelmed and have no idea how to navigate any of this. So my other recommendation here would be to find a peer a peer who's just a little bit above you or a little beyond you in their journey. They've gone through some trials and tribulations. They, ha they have 
ideas of where you can look um, and they will help advocate for you because it is daunting to try to figure out what the right things are to feel better. Yeah, that sounds like a great idea. This is something I've been thinking about as well, like having role models in life instead of latching on to influencers and even thought leaders who are trying to take you, like pushing you towards one narrative over everything else. I think it's great to have role models who are just doing a good job in life and a decent human beings. I think that goes a long way. So I don't know. I think that could be helpful instead of latching on to like one idea over another. So I love what you're suggesting. I would also like to know from you, like, there was a time when I, I know in your older content, you were advocating for people to share their story, for them to be heard, for them to be treated with sympathy and compassion as and when they tell their story. Now people are more ready with their story. And there's almost this attitude of rewarding the victim behavior, like people rush in and they are coddled and they are treated differently almost. And Obviously, some of those people need that because of what they're facing, the challenges that they're facing. They need to be treated with, I guess, in a in a delicate, in a very considered way because their situation is leading them down a path where they need a lot of help. But there, is, there has also been a marked, like this, the, a, a massive fall in resilience. And we are expecting help for things that used to, I'm not framing this the right way, but I, I feel like this is what I want to understand from you, that we have a tendency to now reward victim behavior. And I don't want to talk about doing that to other people, but doing that to ourselves. How do we guard ourselves from falling into that trap? Like if I am telling my story to the world and the world rushes in and now wants to take care of me, how do I identify where I need help versus building up my resilience and my fortitude and my endurance and going out there and living life in a way where I'm progressing consistently and taking on bigger and bigger challenges? I can. Great questions. Okay. I need to address the storytelling part first because I could get past that in my head before I went on to like, how do we get our own selves out of victim mindset? I have to, I have to address the storytelling thing first. So storytelling is one of the most powerful tools that we have as human beings. Again, in our evolution, we were telling stories way before we were doing pretty much anything else. Um, it's so core to how we connect with one another, how we make sense of our own experience. And when it comes to mental health, it works when it's done a certain way. And that, and that certain way is really a um, couple of fold. It's, it's organizing chaos that's in our being, especially around trauma. Um, owning the parts of our narrative that are true for us and then reflecting on our experiences i like to say from the framework of a hero's journey so i went through this horrible thing but not i don't i'm not begging for sympathy what i am is i'm reflecting on the strength that it took to get through that the lessons that i learned along the way the trials and tribulations what i have today that I would have never have had, had I not been tested in this way. My views on myself, my views on the humanity, my views on the world are enriched. And I would not want to wish this harm that I went through by, on anybody else. But because I went through it, I now understand and I have meaning in a different way than I had before. That's how we, we coach our storytellers to tell, to think about telling their story to themselves and to the world. Um, you know, a lot of narrative psychology, the same thing putting the cohesiveness of a story structure on the chaos of our lives is healing. Um, and then thinking about it through the lens of how have I grown through this um, helps us uh, to have a redemptive flavor to our narrative rather than a victim flavor. And the other thing that we do is we don't let our storytellers, shh, well, we don't have that power. We encourage our storytellers to think it through. Think it through before you share your story. Are you ready? Do you have supports in place? Are you? Do you have enough perspective from the thing that you went through that you can actually reflect on what happened to you rather than living in it in the moment? I think some of those things get people tripped up in telling it before they're ready. And then their emotions are so raw that people cannot help but respond. Uh, so I don't, sometimes it's probably intentional that they want that kind of reaction. And sometimes they're just, they're just not ready. And then people want to take care of them. So I always say, if you're, if you're working on your own story in your own head or with your therapist, um, you are where you're at, like just continue. But if you're sharing your story publicly, 
like think it through. What what is your why? Uh, what is your end game? And if your end game is to get a gazillion likes on your Instagram reel, right? Why? <laughs> like, what are you actually trying to do? Yes. Uh, because yes, a powerful, emotional filled story like that will probably get you a gazillion likes on your Instagram reel. What does that do for you? What does that do for the world? What are you trying to do differently in the world? So how do we get ourselves out of our own uh, kind of victim mentality when maybe we are seeking this or soliciting this type of support? I guess we just need to check in with ourselves. Like again, that same kind of question. What is my why here? What am I trying to do? Because if I'm telling the story so that I get people say, oh my gosh, I'm so, right. They're like uh, an overwhelming sense of, sympathy, not compassion. What is that doing for the world? What is that doing for me? Is it empowering me in some way? Um, and if I consistently do that, and then I never change my behavior, how perhaps maybe that's keeping me trapped? How is that reward of getting this huge influx of attention for my pain, maybe keeping me stuck where I am versus helping me transform out of it? It's a great question. Yeah. I may not have framed it well, but you gave me exactly the answer I needed and something to really mull over and think about because, yes, I mean, there is this tendency to, like, but it's been politicized. Like, there are people who are really, really dishing people who talk about their, like, they're sharing their story and then, like, the community gathers around them and they, they're almost demonizing it. But I feel like a lot of people don't know that they're doing it necessarily they're not trying to reel people right. in and, and like they're not playing a game they're just not realizing it how easy it can become to constantly lean on someone lean on validation and then seek out unconsciously be seeking out experiences that continue that pattern so it's not necessarily their fault because it is a tempting tempting situation and yes, d definitely. Um, thank you for that answer. That That's massively. Well, and then, you know, because I, I do have a few people like this in my life. Um, they, I also just want to speak to the fact that they say out loud often what a lot of other people think, but don't have the courage to say out loud. So there, there are some good things that they're doing in terms of making some of these conversations more permissible. Yes. Um, but I worry sometimes that because of all the attention they get back, they have a hard time evolving out of that. Exactly. But they just, like I said, they get they get reinforcement for being, um, for really describing in a very intimate way their their vulnerabilities, is what you know what they're doing, what's happening there, um, and they may not see a pathway out of that where they're getting the same level of attention for healing. Yeah, that is so true. Um, the the other aspect of this is what is happening, like the shift in society that we are seeing where men are not so able to share their story without getting some very contradictory responses. Like masculinity is being demonized. At the same time, men are also not allowed to be vulnerable. Like that continues to be a problem. That was always a problem. How do the male listeners who are listening to this conversation and they need help, how do they navigate that very strange, um, the, the strange world that they find themselves in? Oh, so many double binds for men. So many double binds for men. They're endless. You know, we still expect them to be strong. I mean, whether we say it out loud or not, we still expect yeah. them to be strong. We expect them to solve problems. We expect them to lead. We do. Um, but then if they do, then we demonize them for taking control and being aggressive and like total, total double bind. Um, I have three young adult sons and I, I'm proud of them. They're navigating it at the best of their ability. But I also worry, uh, I worry because life is easier to navigate when your role is clear. Yes. It just is. I know who I am. I know what is expected of me now. 20 years from now, I know where I'm going. It's clear. When our roles and our the expectations are not clear, we falter because we are anxious. Am I going to fail? I don't even know what I'm supposed to be doing here. Constant anxiety about who I am in the world and what I'm supposed to be striving for. Uh, 
So I work a lot. I work a lot with men who hold traditional norms of masculinity. You know, I started my career off in law enforcement, working with law enforcement, first responders, firefighters. I spent a good chunk of my career on college campuses, which was also great from this perspective of empowering young young people to find who they were in the world. It was awesome. And today, I spend a lot of my time working um, in construction, transportation, you know, male dominated industries. So this has actually been a big theme and I like where I'm seeing some of the thought leadership go today. I really recoiled when I heard all of the language of toxic masculinity being thrown at people, thrown at people, not even bantered, like literally thrown at groups of people because I know when people are feeling the finger being shook at them, they don't behave well. And and even if they're trying, they tend to want to hide. Nobody likes to be shamed, attacked, labeled. Nobody. Nobody likes that. And so what I saw starting to happen is that a lot of men just went ducked under the table. (laughs) They just hid. Um, I mean, a few ventured out and tried to navigate it and then felt like they were walking on eggshells the whole time. But a lot of men went and hid because they they said, I don't have any clue what I'm supposed to do here. And especially if they were in roles vocationally where they had to be aggressive, decision-making, problem-solving, in-charge kind of people, which by the way, you want. Yeah. You want your firefighters to put their emotions aside and go in and do what needs to be done to save lives. You don't want them feeling all the feelings in that moment, waffling with their certainty, same with our surgeons, like all of these roles that people play where they need those more traditional norms of masculinity types of qualities. So especially when the men were priding themselves on their ability to do that, and then the rest of the world is telling them they're toxic, a confusing space. So what I'm seeing now that I really love is how do we flip the script? How do we embrace those traditional norms of masculinity and say these traditional norms of masculinity also define a good percentage or some percentage of the modern man? These are not throwback values from centuries ago. The modern man who has a deep sense of honor for himself, his family, his community, the modern man who, you know, wants to have courage uh, in all kinds of spaces, including around his mental health, you know, just taking these traditional norms of masculinity and applying it to the modern man so they don't feel like they're completely alienated to all the things that they feel are true for them. Um, I like how that conversation's going. I just did an exercise two days ago with a room full of sheet metal union workers. I mean, these guys are super tough. My construction dudes, super tough. Big, burly dudes who work with their bodies every day. And by the way, where would our world be without them? People who are willing to stand up 800 feet in the air on scaffolding that builds the buildings that we live and work in. People who are out there toiling in 100 to 10, I don't do Celsius, but you know, really hot weather uh, to put down the pavement and the bridges so we can do the things that we love to do. We would be absolutely nowhere without our construction infrastructure. And yet those are the kind of guys that get really labeled with toxic masculinity all the time. And they they want nothing to do with that conversation. They will just, you know, push the whole thing aside. And yet they're also the ones dying by suicide, dying of overdose, and the consequences of addiction at higher rates than any other vocation. They need to be able to address this in a way that makes sense to them. What can be a possible solution for someone who is feeling lonely and isolated, which is so much, like that's happening so much. Like you said, they don't know what they're supposed to do. There is a shift in the gender roles as well. Some of it is, I think, great, and some of it, is hard to understand, especially for men, because they don't, their roles are being questioned the most and yes. they don't quite know mm-hmm. where, what, where do they belong now in this entire conversation and what areas they get to own completely, if any. And 
so that loneliness that is going bound to happen how do they navigate that and and then how do they also embrace vulnerability like it is such a strange area to navigate again hmm well this has played out in my own life it's been a very interesting journey so Earlier in my marriage, my husband was the breadwinner. He had a degree in geophysics. He was working in oil and gas. I was working part time, raising the kids, nonprofit. You know, I was contributing financially, but I definitely wasn't paying the bills. And then mid marriage, my husband not only lost his job, but pretty much lost his career in uh, in the field, mostly because he just couldn't do it anymore. It was too soul sucking. Um, and that led into you know a big depression for him and all kinds of challenges and uh and then my nonprofit collapsed and we were destitute like that all happened uh, but then my career took off um financially and all in all the ways so i could support the family but the demands of my career meant that my husband needed to take care of the kids and the home and that took a couple of years of adjustment but now we're like all settled in and the kids are grown. So now he just takes care of me, which is lovely. Absolutely lovely. Um, and it works for us because now we're like, we're t again, the roles are clear. I know what I'm doing. He knows what he's doing. We respect each other's space. Um, and when it wasn't clear, there was a lot of resentment, just a ton of resentment back and forth. Like, why aren't you doing that? What'd you spend that money on? Like, ugh, you know, constantly. But now, now we got our lanes and it's clear again. So it kind of flip-flopped the entire dynamic in our, my own relationship. So how do they fight the loneliness? Well, you find peers. I mean, that's really it, whether it's other couples or other men or whatever that have gone through similar things. And, you know, with today's ease of finding like-minded communities, like you can, you can find that if you look for it, um, you can find other like-minded people. The, the difference being is that women tend to be much better at doing that. You know, they, we we see value in in and are more proactive in making sure that our social networks are up to date, intact. We're connecting. We're we're making effort. We're intentional of you know meeting up for coffee, calling people, whatever. Um, a lot of men have been conditioned to be that lone wolf, and if you can't figure it out on your own by yourself, then you have failed. Like it's really that big of a deal which is absolutely ridiculous. Again, we are social creatures from the entire evolution of our, of our being. Like we are meant to be together, but men often are told, like if you can't figure it out on your own. So self-reliance as a value is the strongest traditional norm of masculinity that is connected to suicide. And yet it's so much inherent with so many men who just pride themselves on white knuckling it, I did this all by myself. Look at me. And it really sets men up for honestly a life of misery because I don't care how successful you are. If that's the only thing that gives you a sense of self-worth in your life is how much you've achieved or how much money you've made, you feel empty. Those goalposts always move. You never get there. There's always someone richer or more successful than you. And the more you strive and the harder you work, you lose everything else. You lose your health. You lose your relationship. You lose your sense of meaning because you're just chasing chasing stuff. It doesn't have meaning for you anymore. And it leaves men in a huge sense of loneliness and despair, you know? So we got to, yeah, again, flip the narrative on what it means uh, to be a man, not to take it away, but to reframe it those same core values in a way that's life enhancing for men, not depleting. Yeah, that is so helpful. But I do understand it though. Like you, you said why they would rather white knuckle it than ask for help. I do understand it though, because I don't know why, but men who are suffering and visibly suffering, even then people are so, and this goes for both genders. They're so unwilling to advocate for them. You know, it's not just, labeling someone as a victim you probably i don't know i'm not a mental health expert but you probably sh maybe shouldn't do that but they deserve help they deserve sympathy empathy they deserve understanding and compassion but it is so hard for people to actively advocate for men and treat them like someone deserving of consideration i see that happening a lot and maybe that's one of the reasons why men are so afraid to reach out and grab someone's hand and say that, okay, I, I'm feeling 
this way and maybe I can use some um, a confidant maybe you know what I found though you give them the little the littlest yeah sense of permission or empowerment and the and and just puts a little bit of psychological safety around the situation they are so hungry for it again even my toughest of the tough they are so hungry for it and i'll give you one example so i i've done this a million times and again i have zero credibility i am a girly girl a girly progressive girl i've got zero creds um but i have i i i've watched it happen so many times i say i know that all of you have pain because you're human. We all have pain. You don't know that about each other. And we're gonna keep the stories here. I put them in small groups and boom, there it is. Like five seconds later, we've got people, maybe not talking about their deepest, darkest, I don't want them to, but saying, oh my gosh, yes, when my wife left me, I couldn't sleep for three months or whatever it is. Um, and so the other, about a year ago, I had a very big keynote and I was probably, I don't know, 1500, Construction workers, 97% men in the middle years, traditional norms of masculinity, super tough. And I shared, you know, stuff about mental health and suicide prevention as I've witnessed, not lived through, witnessed in, in their community. Um, you know, and I got off the stage. I took, you know, I'm just like, I just got to get off the stage. I got to get my computer and like pick up my things and I walk off the stage and all of a sudden like I hear this voice I'm just like trying to get out of the way for like the next thing that's happening and I walk to the back of the auditorium and all of a sudden all the all the people in the room mostly men stood up and there's a man at the microphone and he's crying um, because he had just lost a co-worker a beloved friend to suicide and he's crying at the mic in the back of the room they pass the mic back to him everybody stands up they all link arms 1500 of the toughest of the tough, Lincoln arms. And together they started chanting, I have your back. I have your back. You are not alone. I have your back over and over and over again. It was so completely moving, you know? So they do have absolutely the cap capacity to do this. They just need to know it's okay and that other men are feeling the same way. And then boom, it's there. The peer support pieces of this are so healing when people know there's others very similar to them who have already walked the path and they're they're not alone. Yeah, that's beautiful. Thank you for sharing yeah, that. Yeah, it was really amazing. Yeah, if we, if we could just have the whole world do that, like hold hands and just reach out to each other. Mm -hmm. I, I remember those scenes in uh, American sitcoms where like from the show Friends, like those uh, Joey Chandler and Ross would get really emotional with each other and then they'll be like clearing their throat and be like, oh, I've got something in my throat and they'll <laughs> pretend like we did just have this super emotional moment. And, and that's what I always, you know, tell my male listeners, or I would like to say it right now, like you can do that. You can have like a super emotional moment cry even if that's what you need and then be totally masculine the next moment and we'll recognize it and we'll, good. We'll, <laughs> we'll receive that yes. as you put it out there we'll receive it however yeah. you want it received and it's all good and yeah i think another piece that I, I, before i forget that i have seen work its magic yes. is humor humor absolutely humor yeah especially in places where it feels daunting or taboo or we're not sure or like eh, i just want to sit on the sidelines i'm not sure that and all of this like resistance to stepping in the arena as Brene brown says you know a little bit of humor goes a long way now it has to be the right kind of humor obviously it's not humor that pokes fun at but a humor that gets you to self-reflect on your own stuff uh or it's um so man therapy mantherapy.org is what emerged out of of us asking a lot of men in surveys and in interviews and in focus groups, especially men who had survived suicide attempts or near misses, when we asked them, we said, what did you need? What did you need? What would have prevented that moment? Or better yet, upstream from that, what would have prevented the despair that led you to that moment? And they told us a whole bunch of stuff. You know, they said, it's your strong mental health language. We don't resonate with it. And they said, we don't believe those experts really understand our experience. We'd listened to a peer before, you know, people with a whole bunch of letters after their name. Um, 
we want to understand how our physical symptoms like sleep and pain and low energy are connected to this because we don't know that they are basically what they said. And we'll just go to our, our primary doctor and they just give us pills and we think that that's being res resolved, you know, rather than understanding what the root causes are. You know, they said a whole bunch of stuff. Oh, another big one was, can you give us a chance to check in with ourselves first before you send us away? There was this idea of like, you're going to send us away to something that feels really scary or stupid and definitely is not going to work. <laughs> before you send us away to that thing, can we just have an opportunity to check in with ourselves and maybe f try to fix ourselves? Like give us some tools, give us some self-help things that might actually do the trick so we don't have to go to this scary other place. And then we said, okay, great. All of this stuff is super. How do we actually like cut through the clutter and get into your mind or into your ears or into your consciousness? Um, and they said, you make it funny. And we're like, excuse me, what? We're like, we can't make this stuff funny. Like mental health and suicide and addiction. Like, that's not funny stuff. They're like, yeah, but you make it funny, we'll pay attention. You make it funny, you are kind of funny. We're actually going to be curious about what the heck this is. And we might even pass it along to other dudes. So make it funny. So luckily, we worked with the right messaging group, advertisers actually, that understand how to cut through people's clutter of their information, get their attention, and get them to engage. And it's hilarious. I mean, everywhere I show it, men are rolling with laughter. And what the laughter does is it just gets people to exhale. Like, okay, all right, we're going to be okay. And like literally on the hormonal level, our bodies get flooded with things that help us relax. Absolutely. So humor is just, and we bond, we bond over humor. Like humor is just secret sauce stuff here. Uh, but again, it does have to be the right kind of humor because you can really go off the rails if it's the wrong kind of humor. It can be very divisive. So you got to have the right, the right art of the humor. Um, but it's it's excellent, and that's another trick that I learned. Again, woman who has no credibility uh, and had no lived experience, I throw a couple of things in an, of humor, and all of a sudden we're we're buddies now. <laughs> so. Well, that's how I found you. That's uh, I saw man therapies. The website and i was i i thought who came up with this this is awesome <laughs> i sent it to my oh, it was a whole team it was a whole team I yeah loved it. yeah i loved it so much and then i it led me to your you know all the other interviews your ted talk and all and i loved it i was like this is what we need this shows that we care the fact that we like your team came up with this whole idea put this together it shows that we understand you, we understand how your mind works, and we care, we are here for you. I think that is what needs to be said in a variety of different ways so that we can reach as many people, as many men as possible, because I don't see that happening enough. And Well, and that also ties together all the dots of what I'm trying to advocate for. Listen to the people with the lived experience. They will yes. tell you how you get my attention, what I need, what I think is valuable and meet them where they are. Because if it was up to the mental health professionals who, by the way, completely rejected man therapy when it first came out for, you know, this is like, this is superficial. This is making fun of something that's not funny. I'm like, you know what? If you all had figured it out, we wouldn't be having this conversation. I would be, you got as far as we could go. And there's this huge group of men that are completely falling through the cracks because what you're doing is not resonating with them. Maybe we can listen to them and innovate, not try to do the same thing over and over again, with just more effort, but actually do something different. Um, and now, you know, 10 years later, 11 years later, you know, we have a randomized control trial that was huge that shows, yeah, it works. It attracts the men that are hard to reach. They spend a lot of time exploring the resources. They are more likely to seek help. Yeah. I mean, it works. So it works. Yay. Yeah, no, <laughs> yay for innovation. <laughs> absolutely. It works. I have so many times I my um, a male friend would be checking in with me if they know that I'm having a hard time. I would sometimes say, oh, no, no, things are better. And I don't know. Um, I said something like, uh, my soul is happy today. My soul smiling. I'm feeling so good. And then the, the next time he checked in with me, he's like, I'm officially on your period cycle now. So let's keep the conversation going. <laughs> so <laughs> they're willing to have, have that very touchy-feely, <laughs> soft conversation. 
but they're gonna make sure that you understand they're still men and they're gonna mock you and they're gonna make fun of you but you i know that he's still in yes. my corner he is my bud and he's listening to me the the same goes for them you know you can make fun of these things and it's they're taking it seriously they're not they don't think it's it's nonsense they take it very seriously but that's just how you have to reach them i i think man therapy is, is a brilliant idea and yeah i wish it would reach more and more people yeah no it, it's been very it's been a very fun road so i got to do the official shout out to cactus who created all the creatives behind it and honestly the colorado public health department who made it legitimate so from the beginning public health to government right they had to make sure that it was legitimate or they would get egg on their face they would get completely laughed out of the whole thing and because of those two powerhouse mechanisms creativity and legitimacy came together partnered for a decade now we have something that is reaching people and and also the entrepreneurship piece of it we have scaled to you know almost all of the states at this point to the country of australia it's great and again small treatment oriented mental health thinking is not going to get us there we need to partner we need to partner with other types of ways that people influence other ways that we can reach in new ways and move hearts and minds. So I'm all about the collaborative aspect of that project as well. I love it. I, I hope everyone checks it out. Like all my listeners, I hope they check it out. I do have one question here, like to men who are facing a very real situation right now. Like I uh, had a firefighter reach out to me. He read something I wrote for Mind Body Green. He reached out to me and he told me that I am in a relationship where I want my woman to lead. I want my woman to make decisions and I want to do it socially while I'm out with in a social setting. But I'm a firefighter. I'm a manly man and my buds are all manly men. They'll, they're going to laugh at me. How do I go about it and not you know be dismissed as a man from that point forward and i i remember thinking this is getting like this guy has to make a very personal choice but he has to analyze it and analyze it because he's so concerned about other people's opinions and that's how it is for most of us but when you have to deny a fundamental truth of your psychology of your life of your relationship the the crisis becomes very very real and all I could say to him was that you have a choice to make, whether you would rather pander to these people or, you know, shout out That's your right. truth. And so it is, you make the choice, whichever choice feels most comfortable to you at this point in time. And later you can make a different choice. That's fine. But it has to be whatever feels good to you. That was the best I could do. I didn't know what else to say. But it made me wonder if this situation goes on or if the situation gets worse, What's going to happen? And I don't know this person. He just randomly reached out to me. So I don't understand how much this person can take, where he is at, like on this journey. Is he doing okay? So just someone like that, and maybe someone like that is listening right now. If they're in that situation, what would you recommend they do right now? Be who you are and surround yourself with people who make you feel good. So if, if you're not who you are because you're afraid of getting laughed at, that's the wrong road <laughs> because you need to be who you are and surround yourself with people who love you for who you are. Uh, and so I would say, you know, minimize your contact with these toxic peers. You can still your, do your job really well without that uh, and be who you are in your relationship. If that is feeling good to you and that feels good in your relationship in the end, guess who wins? <laughs> and not that it's a win-lose thing, but if you're happy in relationship, you're going to be a more satisfied person. You know, it's just, that's how, you know, it's just how it is. And so find out, find other, cause I'm certain you're not the only firefighter who is trying to figure out gender roles in their relationship and also what it means in the vocation. Like, I'm sure you're not the only one, a lot of emerging, especially the emerging firefighters are all figuring that out right now. You're not the only one. So find them, find the other ones who are also like, ah, how do we do that? And then hang out with them. Cause at least they're in the struggle with you. Um, and, and just, you know, walk away, walk away from the bullshit, <laughs> walk away. Um, because that will speak loud, you know, and I would just also say, come out proud. I mean, if you're solid enough in your relationship, just come out proud. 
they're going to be jealous, honestly, that you have a solid relationship because, you know, the domineering type of relationship doesn't last long. We have uh, mentioned suicide prevention. I do want to go a little bit deeper into that because this is, I think this is an answer that we all see, need. We just don't know how to figure this out. How do we spot the science of something like that in someone, someone we, we care about? Oh, the warning signs and risk factors is just a conversation that I, uh, I get fatigued of having because the people most, I mean, yes, there are definite signs and I will speak to them, but often the people most at risk for dying by suicide are very good at masking and they are very, um, they are very, uh, well, they're very lethal on first attempt often. Um, and they have good reasons for not disclosing. So, and that's again, not everybody, but you know, mostly the men in the middle years who take their lives, it's one attempt and it's fatal and everybody's shocked. So really my answer is talk about it. Like open up the conversation. Don't wait for the big red flag because the big red flag might not come. If you know even some life experiences that they're going through that would make anybody highly distressed, circle the wagons. I mean, and the number one is any kind of disruption in the primary relationship, divorce, separation, domestic violence. You might not know about domestic violence, but you probably know about separation and certainly you know about divorce. Circle the wagons because that is an upending transition for just about everybody, even when it goes well. Um, and that's a, that's an example. Job transition is another one. You know, when you are being let go from a job, you know, for men who identify as provider, identified strongly with their role, um, that's a big deal. Circle the wagons. Um, substance use, right? Because it's so reinforced in peer culture as a way of coping, uh, again, largely I'm talking about United States culture. It varies a lot by different parts of the world. But um, when we did our interviews with the guys who were at risk for suicide, they're like, yeah, because we totally reinforce bad behavior <laughs> when we're struggling. You know, we encourage our male friends to go gambling, like sexual exploitation, drinking, drug use. That's what we do, like when we're having fun. And then it gets us in all kinds of trouble. And then we're wondering why our life sucks. You know, I'm like, well, right. stop doing that. And maybe that would be better. Uh, but yeah, increases in substance use, withdrawal for sure, when people are not engaging in the things that used to bring them joy socially or um, athletically or in their faith community or whatever. It's because it takes energy to engage. It takes energy to be, be with people. It takes energy to do stuff when you're not feeling well that you don't have. You don't have that energy. And what your brain tells you is, you know, stay put, hunker down, hide. Um, so any of those changes, I think, are the big ones. I think the other one I like to highlight for men is anger. So a lot of research that shows that in many men, anger is actually depression that when we have changes in anger where people are flying off the handle with small stressors and small conflicts, they are really suffering. And that's just how it's coming out. And what does anger get men? Anger gets men. I don't want to be anywhere near you. Uh, you're now in trouble at work, in the relationship. If they push it too far, now they're in the trouble with the law. Anger gets men more problems, but it is kind of this instinctual response to when they're experiencing things like depression in particular, it does not get them empathy and compassion, does not get them people leaning in to have open and honest conversations about what's happening, but we can, we can. So that's my other thing. Like when you start to see changes in anger, lean in before it becomes more catastrophic because you know the famous saying, hurt people hurt people, it's true. Um, so those would be some of the things I would look for changes in anger, changes in substance use, and then life circumstances that often lead to despair, distress, things like changes in job, changes in relationship. Now, as people get closer to thinking about suicide, there's a big chunk of the, of the group that will have suicide kind of on the menu, but it's way back here. It's kind of lingering. It's fleeting. 
And then all of a sudden a major thing happens and it's very impulsive. All right. So that's tricky because the surge in suicide intensity goes from zero to 100 very quickly. And if they have access to lethal means, sometimes that's a fatal outcome. Very hard to get in the way of that last little bit. So we've got to do stuff more upstream to prevent that one. Other people plan it and they plan it and they think through it and they tie up their affairs and they you know, do all of these things to make it go the way that they have envisioned it. Um, often in that process, because it's not such a surge, they will give it away. Um, it's just subtle because that, that kind of thinking and planning is a very big secret that is too big to keep. So often they give it away, they, but they give it away indirectly. They give it away with vague statements. You know, one group calls it invitations. They're actually inviting people to have a conversation with them about this. They just, nobody knows what they're listening to. They just know it seems weird. So vague statements about worthlessness or invisibility or failure or whatever, uh, but it just, it's not a direct statement of I'm going to kill myself. It's just indirect. Like, why does this matter? That kind of, that kind of statement. They feel like they're shouting on top of the world. It's too subtle for the everyday person who's just going to talk themselves out of it to pick up. And the more people don't pick it up, the more they feel ignored. So again, that's something to lead into. If the hairs on the back of your neck are going up because it seems like a weird thing to say, ask them, what did you mean by that when you said that? Because usually they got a big answer behind it. They're just looking for the right person to talk to about it. So those indirect kinds of statements that seem odd and speak to someone not doing well, um, the, uh, the, the, the practicing of, of the event um, is also an indicator. So sometimes people do are doing research on their phones or computers. Uh, sometimes they're going to hotspot places, certain bridges or other things that you know they're they're going to there too often. It doesn't make sense. They're changing their behavior around firearms or whatever. Like all of those kinds of things, they're working up as Thomas Strudel saw it, says the capability. They're working up the courage. They're testing things on. They're fantasizing. They're envisioning. All of that is you know taking steps toward. Um, but along that whole journey, we also have ambivalence. So half of the brain, half of the soul, whatever you want to call it, does not want to die. They want to stay. Yeah. And so there's this epic battle that starts to happen. And half the, half the being wants to escape or find relief from their pain. And half the being wants to figure it out and stay. And so they fight inside. And when the, when the epic battle is coming to a head, where it's getting really intense, one of the other telltale signs is agitation. The fight or flight response gets fully engaged because the soul knows it could possibly die, except the saber-toothed tiger in this sense is that person, right? So the fight or flight is going up and up and up because, oh my God, we're going to die, but oh my God, you're the, you're going to do it, you know? So, uh, Agitation, I always say, is our friend because the body gives us away. We can say things out of our mouth all the time that are not reflective of our reality, but we have a hard time controlling this beast. It gives us away. So we blush, you know, or whatever. Like we can't control blushing. We can't control what our blood pressure surges. So if the verbal and the nonverbal are not seeming the same, you just reflect that back. You say, I know you're telling me you're fine, but here you can't keep your eye gaze with me. Your foot's going a million miles an hour under the table and you've gotten up to pace four times here. Or here's another one, sleep, agitation. And we've all had the bad nights where we toss and turn and toss and turn and toss and turn because we got something on our mind. When it comes to suicide intensity, Many people just stop sleeping for days as they're working their way up to the act. And again, that's the ambivalence fighting it out all through the night. So ask them about sleep because we don't tend to have shame about talking about not sleeping. It's a good window into, you know what, sometimes people don't sleep well when they're having a tough time or you having a tough time, you know, and then into deeper conversations about suicidal thoughts. So those are just some things I think to look for. But I would also just say, ask. 
ask again, create psychological safety, make it a trusting relationship, like work hard to earn the trust where you're going to get an honest answer, but then just ask, even if you think you might be wrong, which is the fear. Like, what if I'm wrong? What's the worst case scenario that happens when you're wrong? Maybe there's a moment of embarrassment. I don't know. Maybe they are offended. That's a possibility. Like people play out all of these tremendously horrible scenarios. Like what if that actually drives them to suicide? It won't. If you come at it with compassion and gentleness and I care about you and I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I, you don't seem like yourself and I miss yourself. Like I miss you. Um, it's not going to put an idea in someone's head. It's going to, people feel seen and heard and known and it just opens up the door for a rich conversation and, and companionship. Uh, but people, so if they're offended, you just say, I see my questions upset you, you know, tell me about what that's about because it's not about you. It's about them. Um, and they're afraid. They're afraid of your judgment, your rejection. You're going to take control away, like all kinds of fears. So just stay the course and be curious. Um, and reflect back what you see. If the person that we spot these signs in is someone we are not very close to, like maybe that person is at best an acquaintance, then in that case, can we approach them ourselves or do we reach out to someone who is close to them and talk to them about it? I think anyone can do this work, even strangers. Anyone can lean in and, and do this work. And sometimes having a more inner circle person complicates the situation because they want to protect that other person. Sometimes it is the second ring of acquaintances and coworkers and neighbors and so on that can actually move the needle a little bit farther because they just have a little bit more of an objective relationship. Again, this played out in my life. I had a, a loved one who uh, was entrenched in an addiction. Someone very close to me um, hit it really well. And it was a, it was, you know, a second rear ring person who stepped in and said, yeah, let's go. <laughs> We're going to go get help. We're going to go now. Um, in a way that I could never have done because it was hidden from me. So, so yes, I think anybody can do this work. You know, Kevin Hines, one of the most famous stories of a suicide attempt survivor who survived a, a jump off the Golden Gate Bridge. You know, he talks about, he walked over the bridge um, in, with the, uh, with the question, which is, if anybody sees how upset I am, he's crying, he's very visibly upset. If anybody sees upset up at me and asks me, are you okay, then I won't jump. But if nobody notices that I am standing here crying, then obviously I don't matter. And then of course somebody interacted with him and they didn't ask him and he jumped. Um, but that's what I mean, like that, that you know, that's why it's important. I was sitting next to someone on an airplane one day and she's crying. Like, how could I not say, I noticed you're crying. I'm here if you want to talk about it, you know, <laughs> total stranger, you know, but we do, we can do that even with people we don't know or acquaintances. Yeah, thank you for saying that because if somebody is in pain, you stop and you reach out to that person. It should be a no-brainer. And yet we all just, you know, it's like that that metro thing. Everyone is looking down into their Kindle and their phones. phones. <laughs> and somebody could be getting like... Stabbed. <laughs> yes. <laughs> like this is so strange. This is, it is a huge statement on the state of humanity now. And it feels wild and so uncomfortable every time you think about it, it makes you very very sad well i think we've been so one of the other things that gets our attention is fear and marketers know this advertisers know this politicians know this business leaders know this even faith leaders know this that they can get our attention by making us afraid and they play it all the time because we pay attention if we're afraid because we don't want anything to happen to us. But the problem with being afraid all the time is that we go into self-defense. That's our innate instinct. I don't want to get hurt. I don't want to get in trouble. So I go into self-defense. And self-defense does not invite empathy. It does not invite compassion because my needs are threatened. So I need to protect me and mine. And that's it. And this is why things like all the security systems in the world have made it gazillion dollars because, oh boy, do we play up all of those fears of everything in our life, whether it's our computer, our home, our kids or whatever. Oh my gosh, people have made so much money off of these fears. 
And what a trap that is to constantly be in a heightened sense of everything I love is everything I care about is going to be taken away from me in an instant. It's, tr it's a trap, a complete trap, but it, but you know, again, we've been manipulated to not think of others because we got to protect our own and everybody's suspect, everybody's suspect. Yeah. It's bad. <laughs> yeah. It's so true. Despite all of that, do you feel optimistic with, how the social forces are playing right now. Do you feel like things are going to change for the better? I have to. Otherwise, I couldn't get up every day and do what I do. So that's just part of my personality, too. I, I see the hope everywhere. And I know a lot of people don't. So, But that that's what keeps me going. I would say my experience just in the construction industry, just in the last five years, gives me so much hope. So much hope. To, I watch the needle just go like this of people who have never said anything, you know, is now standing arm in arm in a room of 15 people, 1500 people crying. Uh, OSHA, like major government policy agencies getting on board. Funding, you know, $9 million, one check to, from a construction company to a suicide prevention organization, like big, big things, big things, as well as the micro, like watching two big burly war-torn veterans hug and cry and be there for each other. Like the whole gamut of it, that gives me a tremendous amount of hope. But the other thing that gives me hope that in 10 years, we're gonna be in a different place, isn't the technology advancements. I actually am a, a bit afraid of that uh, just because we get so in love with our technology that we forget our humanity. I have hope because I think the Gen Z emerging leadership, emerging group of amazing young people, they're gonna, they're going to burn down. <laughs> uh, they're going to burn down like all of these things that we've just like, oh, if we just tweak it and make a little tweak it and make a little like, no, like start over. I have so many questions, but I know I'm running out of time so for, for my final question. I just want to ask if you want to direct people to any resource, anything you want to share that you want people to pay attention to. If I have a second or two, I'd like to illuminate a couple. All right, so we talked about man therapy, mantherapy.org. It's in English. I know you have a global audience, many who probably speak English, but I also want to acknowledge fully that a lot of what I'm going to be talking about is US biased, be it as it may. It's, it's now tra translated into Spanish, so that's good, but we need to do a lot more. Um, so that's our men's mental health campaign that helps people um, figure out, am I okay? Uh, should I be worried about myself? And then on to different resources. Construction Working Minds, constructionworkingminds.com.org gets you to the same place. That is our construction specific mental health platform. It is in nine languages. Woot, woot. Um, <laughs> and again, I think it's the biggest website, biggest suicide prevention website for the globe. That is especially one that's specifically for construction, but one of the biggest ones for the globe. I don't know, other than the World Health Organization, another like suicide specific organization that's translated into many languages. So we're really proud of that. Um, the Workplace Suicide Prevention. So that was constructionworkingminds.com or .org. Workplacesuicideprevention.com takes you into the national strategy for workplace suicide prevention where work organizations, so it could be an employer, it could be a union, it could be a professional association, they can come in the door, take the pledge to make suicide prevention a health and safety priority at work, and then get access to nine practices that they can implement today. You know, just baby steps that they can take to advance the strategy, the comprehensive and sustainable strategy for suicide prevention, wherever they are, across industries, size of companies, sectors, et cetera. Um, and then uh, my, my new baby, and it's not just me, but our new baby, uh, HOPE certification, emerged out of those national guidelines. And the idea was the guidelines are hard. I mean, it's not easy, light stuff. Um, you need, people were afraid to take action steps in that space. They wanted more coaching and assistance. So we developed a certification program that we call HOPE. It stands for helping our people elevate through tough times. We were coached not to put the word suicide in the title because people would shy away, but talk about something positive, helping our people elevate. Yeah, okay, great. Um, but they come in the door and we don't shy away from the hard stuff once they're inside. <laughs> I was like, that's my compromise. We're not shying away from the hard stuff. Uh, and again, or at an organizational level, by implementing the nine practices of the national strategy, 
organizations can earn bronze, silver, gold, platinum for their ability to do that at best practice. So that way we are recognizing and rewarding the organizations that are leading in the space of strategic and team-oriented implementation of these practices. And that has been a massive labor of love because that's where I see the culture change happening that we really need to see. It's not a one-off awareness day. It's not a one-off training. It's deep cultural work with inside an organization where everybody is participating. Yay. Um, so that's a big one. Uh, we have United Suicide Survivors International is kind of the nonprofit arm of my passion projects. United Suicide Survivors International is working to help people with lived experience turn their pain into purpose. So it could be a loss, it could be a suicide attempt, suicidal thoughts, or the caregiving and supportive roles that we play. These are difficult, really difficult experiences for people. How do we turn that pain into changing something, changing something in the world, systems, cultures, advocacy, whatever it is. So we have this amazing group of, of survivors and we get together and we plot on how we're going to change the world. And it's so much fun. Uh, so we have a couple of conferences to that end. We've had a couple of lived experience summits, which have been so great. It's just like a bunch of really feisty advocates and advocates, activists who, you know, are demanding change. I mean, I say it's fun because these are where my friends are and I just love being with them. But honestly, there's a lot of urgency and we are, um, we are gaining power in our voice and we are also working hard to collaborate, collaborate with the academics, collaborate with the clinicians, collaborate with the policymakers and say, we need all of us at the table to make the systems and cultural change that's needed to save lives here. And then lastly, my own website, sallyspencerthomas.com. I'm also active on all of the platforms, although I'm better at some than others. I'm not very good at Instagram, sadly. I'm just too freaking old. But I'm pretty active on LinkedIn. I used to be active on Twitter now that it's X. Meh. Somewhat active <laughs> on Facebook. But uh, LinkedIn, for sure. Facebook, if you want to see pictures of my puppy as well, that's fine. Um, and uh, I love to hear from people. So I have two podcasts of my own. Hope Illuminated is long form on topics related to mental health and suicide prevention for people who really care about that. And then Headspace for the Workplace for workplace leaders. So we've reached the end of this video. Thank you so much for watching and for sharing your time with me. The video description will have the link to all the resources mentioned during the conversation. And if you would rather listen to these episodes, then you can find Experimental Podcast on most podcast platforms. If you enjoyed the video, please do share your thoughts in the comment section. And if you want to watch more, subscribe to the channel, please, and do hit the notification bell. I will see you again in the next video. Till then, please do take care of yourself. Bye.